This is Reverend Dr. Nditeme Chaliman, Yaounde Field Pastor, Cameroon Baptist Convention for Baptist Morning Meditation on CRTV National Station. The inspiration for today's sermon is drawn from my colleague and teammate, Reverend Tamfu Elvis Samari, who is not here. I am flanked by Reverend Jinkwe Eric, who is fine tuning the technical details of this homily while Reverend Wani Joseph of Rehoboth Oyumaba is here to add his voice to mine in and through the reading of scripture from 1 Kings chapter 12 and verses 6 through 14. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon his father while he was yet alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they said to him, If you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, What do you advise that we answer these people who have said to me, Lighten the yoke that your father put on us? And the young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus shall you speak to these people who said to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, my little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day. As the king said, come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people harshly and forsaking the counsel that the old man had given him. 14. He spoke to them according to the counsel of the young man, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Here ends the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, maker of heaven and earth, all leaders, all kings, all emperors, and all leaders in all institutions, they are all in your hands. We pray that whatever level any leader is placed, Lord, may they be servant to the people rather than masters and oppressors of the people. Blessed be your name as we deliver this sermon in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, Jesus Christ, the servant leader, gave his life for us. What have we given for him? Let us welcome this song to serve our transition.
Dear listeners, issues around leadership have formed the core of the past two editions of Baptist Morning Meditation. Today, we are offering yet another piece on leadership. The title on this sermon is The Leader as a Servant. More than ever before, we thank our Maker and Creator for giving us another chance to preach and to listen. Israel, dear friends, was birthed under an absolute theocracy, under the direct government of God. The invisible Yahweh was their only king. But the chosen people of Israel later became dissatisfied with theocracy and desired to have a king after the manner of the surrounding nations. Hence, Israel moved from a theocracy under the government and rule of God to a monarchy under the government and rule of a human being called king. Saul was the man God chose as their first king. Of Saul's reign, 1 Samuel 13 verse 13 to 14 reads, I quote, You acted foolishly. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command, end of quote. The man after God on heart was David. The David of Israel, dear listeners, is not simply the greatest of Israel's kings. He monopolizes all the institutions of Israel. With all his epaulets, David is merely human and finite. They appointed our king and David gave way to Solomon. Solomon's reign has sometimes been dubbed as the Augustan age of the Jewish nation. Solomon was not only Israel's Augustus, but also its Aristotle. With all his wise qualities and quantities, a King Solomon was merely a human being, destined for an earthly end. His son, Rehoboam, succeeded him upon his death. 1 Kings 12 reveals one of the turning points in Israel's history. God was in the history of Israel, and God is in all our contemporary history. God is the master of this world, dear friends. He exalts a leader, casts down another, and makes the very wrath of man to praise him. Solomon was not only a leader of great wisdom, as we can see in 1 Kings 3, 16 to 28, he valued and indeed had good advisors. But Solomon subjected the people to forced labor and placed oppressive burdens of taxation on the people in order to pay for his luxurious palace and massive public works. Solomon the Great went the way of his fathers, and by right of succession, the crown fell to Rehoboam, his son. For ages, the old city of Shechem retained its ancient dignity just as the city of Reims in France, the old capital of France, continued to be the scene of coronations long after the national capital moved to Paris. All Israel assembled at Shechem to crown Rehoboam as king. Rehoboam came down in royal state from Jerusalem and the people were prepared to receive him as their king. A King Solomon bequeathed to his son Rehoboam at least four significant things. The one, Solomon left to his son a solidly united country. 
Second, Solomon handed to Rehoboam an unarguably peaceful country. Thirdly, Solomon left to his son an economically prosperous country, 1 Kings 4, 20-28. And of course, Solomon left behind to his son Rehoboam a gorgeous temple and a magnificent palace, 1 Kings 10, 14-28. A King Rehoboam began his reign with a blunder, assuming that the throne was his by divine right of succession, ignoring the ratification of the people. The people wanted some relief from the heavy taxes of members of King Solomon's cabinet, advised to submit to the people's demand because such action would assure their loyalty to him. Rehoboam wanted encouragement rather than counsel. Had Rehoboam listened to the senior counselors, he would have taken the right course. But pride and arrogance would not let him go. Rehoboam turned to another and more congenial class of advisors, the young men who grew up with him as proud, as shallow, and as hot-headed as himself. The political trainees of Rehoboam's generation, dear friends, having grown up in palaces, temples, and parks of unsurpassed excellence, couldn't resign themselves to living less luxurious life. Character is assimilated with those with whom we associate. The popular proverb is profoundly true, namely, a man is known by the company he keeps. The fault of Rehoboam lay not in consulting younger men per se, but rather much more to be governed by private considerations. Human beings are as slow to give up power and worth as Pharaoh was as slow to release the Israelite slaves. Dear friends, you are on Baptist morning meditation. The circumstances in which Rehoboam commenced his reign was unusually hazardous. Rehoboam fancied that the son of Solomon could pass to the throne unchallenged. But the ten other tribes thought differently. They refused to come to Jerusalem and pay Rehoboam homage. They met Rehoboam in Shechem not with submission, but with a bill of rights. The people did not go into open rebellion. They had many grievances that they longed for redress. Rehoboam, although the son of a wise father and king, had not the common sense to accede to the people's request. The crisis that exposes a leader's mistake often develops the leader's wisdom, if at all the leader has any. As someone has rightly remarked, Rehoboam lived in a fool's paradise, blind and deaf to what would have arrested the attention of a sensible national leader. Rehoboam was behaving as though he was not living among the people or he was not leading that same nation. Wisdom, talent, and piety, which we saw in Psalm Hereditary. No part of Solomon's far-famed wisdom descended to his son Rehoboam. Rehoboam was rather more than lacking in common prudence and in his capacity for government. Leaders who exercise despotic power and their defenders and associates are accustomed to base their claims on their divine not one that has always been allowed or conceded by leaders. Charles II of England endeavored to secure the passage of a bill limiting the rights of tea. Several world leaders nowadays attempt to pass laws limiting their citizens' rights. God calls the world to witness the humiliation sustained by injustice and or oppression. Any government or institution founded on injustice or oppression has in it the elements of its own destruction, as it were the case with Rehoboam. Quite often, proud and arrogant leaders in their own lifetime behold their scepter ranged by an unexpected hand. From the terrible, relentless, persistent tyranny, after due but vain remonstrance, a King Rehoboam's subjects believed that they had a divine right and mandate to free themselves from Rehoboam's tyranny. Leaders are in leadership because of and for the people. The people are not there because of their leader. 
This idea is expressed in the jargons of political science by the affirmation that a sovereignty belongs to the people. In the rhetoric of a democracy, the government of a nation at all times deserves respect, loyalty, and obedience. That is why Romans chapter 13 calls on all citizens to respect and obey their leaders. This is when she ceases to fulfill its function as a blessing rather than a curse to the people. That is exactly where Rehoboam was before the other ten tribes retired from his rule. During Rehoboam's first week in office, his grandiose ideas and failure to read the political climate resulted in a rebellion in which 10 non-conformist tribes disaffiliated and made Samaria their political capital. The 10 rebellious tribes under Jeroboam formed the Northern Kingdom which retained the historical name of the nation Israel. The two tribes that remained loyal under Rehoboam assumed the name Judah, the name of Rehoboam's tribe. The division of the kingdom from Rehoboam was absolutely determined by God. It was positively predicted by a prophet of God. Still in denial, dear listeners, Rehoboam refused to recognize the separate self-governing nation, downplaying and considering it as an internal revolt that can simply and easily be redressed and addressed by police action. From the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin that remained loyal to him, a King Rehoboam assembled an army to crush the rebellion, believing that it was going to be merely a military picnic for his army. Jeroboam, a king of the ten tribes in rebellion, prepared his armies to defend the northern kingdom. But just as civil war was looming over the nation, the Lord sent the prophet Shemahiah to Rehoboam with the clear message that he must not fight this war. The rest of Rehoboam's reign is summarized in Second Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 14, which says he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Henceforth, until the fall of Samaria, capital of the northern kingdom, Israel, rather than Judah, fills the chief place in the next few centuries upon the historian's page. There were many natural causes leading to separation of the kingdom. Weakness, recklessness, and wickedness on the part of King Rehoboam and his young advisors was on one hand, and on the other side was a great people triggered by a sense of injustice under the rule of an ambitious and unscrupulous king. These factors combine to share fellowship, affording causes for a disruption deep and almost irreversible. Dear friends, from Israel's history, it is in evidence that great transformations may take place under God's guidance without an iota of violence. The people failed in their conference, but they succeeded in quietly accomplishing a great change. The sacred text teaches us that the revolt was of the Lord. Even into the hands of demagogues and manipulators, power will often pass with God's permission. Those who trust in God do not revolt against leadership. They rather pray and wait upon the Lord. Two unfortunate fallouts from the catastrophic leadership of King Rehoboam were the division of the kingdom and the widespread corruption of idolatry. Senseless pride, dear listeners, can become an overly expensive luxury for a leader. Pride and arrogance cost Rehoboam far the best part of his dominions and the richest jewels in his crown. Pride seems to be a cause of strength for some leaders, but it is indeed rather a source of weakness. Dear friends and listeners, the power of a leader is in his grace and not in his whip. A leader is great because of character, marked by humility and humanness. The asset of a monarch's throne is service and compassion for the people 
from the low and lowly to the high and mighty. A throne built on such foundation will last. A King Rehoboam's reign was the old story of the consequence of selfish and inconsiderate autocracy. Rehoboam's ideal of sovereignty was being served by the people rather than serving the people. The world's leaders have mostly and invariably been those served by their people. The people were Rehoboam's servants and he was not their servant. His will was their law and the rights of the people were an illusion to him. Many had the sentiment of exclusion or not belonging to the common worth of the nation. Look up 1 Kings 12 and verse 6. The old idea of forcible dominion over the people was largely the governing principle of Rehoboam's politics. Unfortunately, dear friends, a politics before and after Rehoboam until date has too often been a game of ambition rather than a sphere of service. The idea of service is ennobled by the Lord Jesus Christ as a leader who was servant of all as minister to his disciples. Leaders are to serve God and the people. Jesus Christ rules more than Caesar because Jesus put himself at the service of the people. Instead of appearing as a grand monarch, ministered unto, quoted and flattered, Jesus came as a servant, ministering ever unto others. Instead of being rich, he had not where to lay his head. In the stead of courting the great, rich and wise, he sought the poor and lowly. And he has in this world a name which is above every name at whose mention millions of hearts rise and millions of heads bow in loving adoration and worship. The world's thought is that power liberates from obligation, while Jesus' thought is that power emphasizes obligation. One of the most impressive pictures of power in world history, dear friends, is that of Edward, the Black Prince of England. 664 years ago, precisely on September 19, 1356, Edward, the Black Prince, defeated France on French soil at the Battle of Poitiers, taking captive the King of France, John II, whom Edward escorted to England, where the captured king waited four long years before his release. Edward won distinction for his polite and mannerly treatment of his royal French prisoner. During the confinement of the captured French monarch in England, Edward was serving the French king himself at table, calming and comforting the humiliation of defeat with praises of the French king's bravery and with kindly assurances he made to the king. What lessons can we glean, dear listeners, from the leadership disaster and coma and catastrophe of King Rehoboam and this whole saga. First, God gives opportunities to individuals and to nations even though he knows that they will not improve them. The ambitious Jeroboam and the weak Rehoboam are alike God's agents. Rehoboam and his opportunity had his opportunity both before and after the division of the kingdom. He wasted that opportunity and he wasted it with wickedness. Another lesson is that Israel, in order to express the divine will, must be conscious of its dependence on God. Furthermore, dear friends, leaders should seek and stick to good counsel and to good counselors. Proverbs 11 verse 14 is to the effect that where there is wise counsel, there is safety. And Proverbs 15 verse 22 adds that without wise counsel, plans will fail. A servant leader cultivates the habit of speaking, uniting, conciliatory, reconciliatory, and consoling words to the people. Even when the going gets tough 
or when the people are too stubborn or outright wrong. A God-fearing servant leader avoids using words that belittle the followers. When or if a servant leader has the venom, excuse me, when or if a leader has the venom of a snake in the mouth, then you have a Rehoboam on the seat of a leadership. The wisdom of Proverbs 15 verse 1 is strongly that a gentle answer turns away wrath. Dear listeners, you are on Baptist Morning Meditation, served by the Cameroon Baptist Convention at CRTV National Station. Your preacher, humbled by the privilege, has been Reverend Dr. Nditeme Chaliman, Yaounde Field Pastor, by the grace of God. Reverend Wani Joseph enriched our team in and through the reading of our scriptural text. The technical output of this homily has been the labor of Reverend Jim Quen Eric of Covenant Baptist Church, Chinga. May we prayerfully ask the Lord Almighty to grant us another chance to meet again three weeks away from today. For all things that leaders do with humility in the name of God the Father, for all things that leaders do with the love of God the Son upon a seeking counsel from God-fearing counselors, and for all things that leaders do to keep the unity and peace of their people, thanks to God the Holy Spirit, glory be to God. Amen. We are reachable in or around Yaoundé at 656-363-586. 656-363-586. In or around Yaoundé. And in Bamenda or around Bamenda, you can call 677-224-438. 677-224-438. In or around Bamenda. And until we meet again in three weeks' time, goodbye.